Baltimore. I am delighted to be here today. I want to thank my old dear friend, Deborah McDowell, for inviting me, for bringing me across the vast Atlantic for my sabbatical to take part in this wonderful symposium. Um, and I'm also, you know, kind of stealth on this panel because I was originally going to be on yesterday afternoon's panel, but Jonathan Simon and I did a little duet and it worked out very well, I think. I am not a political scientist, and although I too am going to show uh, slides for pictures, I just show pictures, um, <laughs> and I talk about my pictures. Uh, I want to say a couple of things uh, as I begin, and I will talk as fast as I can, and just plug my coattail if I talk too long. Um, uh, for those of us who uh, sort of came of intellectual age in the era of the development of African American studies, I think we can all agree that the urge, the urgency of theory was extremely important to our formation. Am I right? Yes. Okay. The urgency to theory. We had to learn to theorize, and we had to learn to understand where theory was, right? What kinds of expressive culture, what kinds of representation, what kinds of writing and doing and being constituted theory. Now, by theory, I mean explanations for how the world works. By theory, I mean guides for action. It strikes me that today, in African American studies, there is an urgency that is gathered, that is accumulated around the question of policy. Indeed, I think policy is the new theory. And that in a sense, policy is the politics, what method is to research. Right? It gives us some guide for action. It gives us a way of thinking about how to experiment in order to try to produce outcomes which, if successful, if it's what we're looking for, we hope we can reproduce. Okay, all right. So um, this is California. California is, is a state with many, 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 many prisons in it. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, but why I have this picture here is to show you a picture that the California State Department of Corrections, which is now the Department of Corrections, uh, put on its website to demonstrate the uh, vastness of its uh, physical plant. The fact of the matter is that this is not all the prisons in the state prison system. They're actually 98, and they only have 33 on the map. Um, uh, and, and I believe that they only have 33 on the map in order to, to um, uh, promote constantly what Angela Davis was talking about last night, and that is the need for more. So they sort of underrepresent uh, the number of prisons so that they can constantly go back to the legislature and go back to uh, the public and say, we need more, we need more, we need, we need more. This is downtown Los Angeles, and I give you a picture of the skyline in order to um, help us sort of concentrate for a moment on what has happened to the economy in the United States over the last 25 years. As the shift from manufacturing, from what we like to call the real economy, to the economy that blew up last fall, the finance economy, um, it significantly changed not only the skyline of Los Angeles, but the lives and outcomes of millions and millions and millions and millions of people around the world, and um, including in Los Angeles County, which is the principal uh, prison sending county of um, California. Now, I bring you to Los Angeles County not in order to irritate people who are tired of hearing about California, but in order to sort of focus a little bit on the sort of the problem of or the relationship between surpluses of labor and capital and land and state capacity in times of crisis and how these surpluses have been organized into prisons when other kinds of organizational solutions have always been available. Always. There was never a time when these surpluses of finance capital and land and labor and state capacity could not have been organized differently. Right? They could have been. There's nothing inevitable about prison growth in the United States. Los Angeles County is the um, number one or number two manufacturing county in the United States, even though there's been this big shift to finance uh, uh, global fire sector.
United States from the Communist Party, and this is a hammer and sickle on my star. <laughs> <laughs>
otherwise uh, threatened with homelessness in, in, in that area, many of whom have just come home from prison, have just come out of prison, uh, individuals and their families as well. The owner of this building, uh, sort of taking a page out of a very old playbook, um, decided not unreasonably, not unreasonably at all, to completely disinvest in the building, to say not put another dime into keeping it even minimally legal to rent, you know, cockroach and rat infested rooms to people who needed some kind of modest shelter and instead shut it down as a place to live, but makes it available for filming if you want to make a movie about people who have to live in a place, you know, in shelter and last resort. And what, of course, he's doing, this owner is doing, is waiting for the gentrification market to catch up with this block, at which time he will make oodles of money. Oodles of money. So the rent that he's foregoing now is completely, you know, rational decision in uh, the world of real estate and economics. All right. Now, affordable housing, like any other working class right, is one for which people fought and struggled over the years. Not one single right is something, as Frederick Douglass taught us long ago, is given to you. Right? You take it and you keep it. Um, this is affordable housing that was built after World War II. It was built because people coming home from World War II uh, struggled, set up tent cities and so forth in order to get it. Now, Mumia Abu Jamal said uh, famously about 10 years ago that the biggest public housing project is really, you know, for poor people um, in the United States is prison. And prison after prison after prison has been built, you know, throughout the United States as public housing and other um, uh, uh, opportunities for advancement and shelters, uh, protections from calamity for working class people have disappeared. The prisons, as you know, are mostly built in rural areas. And I talked a little bit yesterday, I think, during Q&A about why that should be. Many, many, many state governments and the federal government as well have tried to put prisons in urban communities, right? And they have usually failed. And they have failed because a certain kind of concentration of political capacity, of organizational capacity, combined with a complexity of who the um, uh, uh, employers of people in the community are, has made it possible for people to go up against the uh, establishment of a prison in their community. And they have not been able, have not been able to do that same kind of political work in rural communities because the political landscape is so different, because the elites are, are fewer in number and have a greater reach into the households of the kinds of ordinary people who otherwise would not want prisons in their towns. I have worked with people organizing against prison construction in rural towns throughout the United States, throughout the United States. My specialty is California. I've worked everywhere in this country. And one thing that's been very interesting to me has been that many, in many communities, the leaders of the we don't want a prison faction is usually starts out two, three people sitting around a table, have been um, often self-employed. Right? They're the ones who can take the risk in the first instance. And then the people who join are the people who then have everything to lose. Everything to lose. People who live in housing that's owned by their employer, for example. Their employer who wants the prison to come in to take pressure off any upward, uh, any pressure off him uh, for any demands for raise wages in agricultural resources. Okay. Um, again, in rural, no less than in urban communities, in the Great Depression forward, people fought and fought and fought, um, often successfully for decent housing. This is farm worker housing in 1932 in Corcoran, California, a place now that has 11,000 people in prison and 8,000 people in the free world. Farm workers, Filipino, Mexican, Mexican-American, African-American, and various sorts of Anglo, Anglos, or white Americans, organized and fought very much under Communist Party and CIO leadership and brought down, eventually under CIO leadership, and brought down the, um, stopped the harvest in that community, it's cotton, by the way, in 1933, and again, under CIO leadership in 1938, here's a guy with his union card. I'm going to skip back because I don't have time to talk through it. One of my students made this beautiful thing. She took a, uh, an advertisement that was sort of trying to attract people to move to California that was made um, in the late 
19th century and turning it to this. <laughs> Government cages. Government cages. And that is indeed what is happening in rural California and around the world. Now, as we know, uh, rural workers, agricultural and other workers, no less than urban workers, have organized to try to secure decent wages, benefits, um, and housing and other goods for their families. In California, uh, most famously, the United Farm Workers organized in, uh, in rural areas throughout the state in order to try to secure uh, good wages and decent living conditions for farm workers of whatever citizenship. And I get a little nervous with that word citizenship because it, it sometimes suggests that if you don't have the right paper, that you are already less than. So, here we have um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta standing in the field some time ago. Interestingly enough, the California Department of Corrections built one, two of its most gargantuan prisons right in the shadow of, actually forming a shadow on, 40 acres and a mule, 40 acres being the site of the UFW headquarters in Delano, California. <laughs> so it's prison, prison, jail, 40 acres. Today, in spite of all of the efforts on the part of the United Farm Workers and other unions to organize farm workers and keep the level of organization up to where it had, um, uh, to the levels that it achieved in the, um, in the 1970s and early 1980s, today farm workers like this gentleman are living not even in those shacks that workers fought to get rid of in the 1930s, they're living in the bushes, literally. There are, there are labor camps throughout California now, and I would guess throughout the southeast as well, uh, in Texas and the southwest, where people, uh, men and women and children, are living in the bushes. And yet, housing continues to go up in this form. Now, in spite of the fact that California has built a prison per year for the last 23 years, um, the state has constantly said there isn't enough space for all the people we need to have in cages. Um, and I showed you that map early on to give you an indication of one of the ways, one of the sort of rhetorical ways that the state makes that claim, right? Sort of naturalizes its scarcity of resources <coughs> in order to try to grab even more of the state budget, which is that Professor Weaver uh, was saying earlier, has become such an enormous part of general social spending throughout um, state uh, and federal governments in the United States. So here we have a picture that makes you think of that TV show 24, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a little like Jack Bauer had to come out and start shooting people <laughs> and torturing them. Well, this is actually a picture from the California Department of Corrections website when uh, Governor Schwarzenegger sent a bunch of prisoners off to, I forget where, maybe Missouri, um, in order to demonstrate very dramatically the shortage of space in California prisons. Now, as Jonathan Simon, I think, mentioned the other day, maybe it was when we were talking privately, um, the California Department of Corrections now um, facing a uh, judgment from the Ninth Circuit Court uh, saying, you know, you're never going to get it right. So you were, we have decided that the only way you can fix that system in California is by decarcerating, decarcerating 50,000 people. 50,000 people. The last time California decarcerated a uh, significant number of people was when Ronald Reagan was governor. Mm -hmm. All right, so it hasn't happened since Reagan. And Schwarzenegger famously has a bust of Reagan on his desk, so maybe he'll follow his mentors. Uh, <laughs> now, the other thing that that picture of the people getting in the play makes me think of is not only Jack Bauer and his regional torture habits, proclivities, but also the real story, the true story, it says in Portuguese, of the CIA flights, you know, the torture taxis that have taken people off to secret prisons run by the United States all over the world. This book was uh, co-authored by one of my graduate students from uh, UC Berkeley, an amazing and brilliant person named Trevor Paglin. Anything he does, you should check out. He's an artist and a geographer. He's got four books out and he just finished his dissertation 11 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm his student, right? <laughs> Last night, the, 
proliferation of prisons around the planet, right, and the sort of carceral system of state growth that is being normalized and naturalized and perpetuated by U.S. policy, policy interventions, both official, above the table, and under the table like this, are cause for concern because it's not only the horribleness of this country going down the line that Professors Weaver and Owens discussed uh, so eloquently earlier on this panel, but also the fact that this form of torture, all prison being torture, and this form of social control is being shocked to the rest of the world. It's being shocked to the rest of the world. And in fact, I think, when these kinds of um, uh, excesses come to view, what they do is not so much shine a bright light on the whole system as reprehensible, right, as murderous, as genocidal, but rather what they do, I'm afraid, is they normalize the rest of the system. Well, it's too bad they do this. If only everyone they arrested was put in the regular criminal justice system, it would yeah. be fair. Right? And indeed, in the dream of many people, the problem with Guantanamo is people have gone to the regular criminal justice system, rather than that the whole system is the problem. Okay. Um, a few years ago, so this is a map from 2000, a few years ago, um, one of the, uh, the, how do I want to say, the moral panics that swept through California um, and was widely represented on the news was that there were uh, uh, al-Qaeda cells in the California state prison system. And the people in these cells, when they got out, were going to start committing terrorist acts, right? <laughs> and uh, so there was you know, constant, sudden, constant, very focused attention on Muslims in California prisons. Of course there are lots of Muslims in prisons, right? The, one of the institutions that does the greatest outreach to people who are incarcerated the Nation of Islam, and also non-NOI mosques. There are lots of Muslims in prison. Whether they were Muslims when they went there, they come out as Muslims, right? They come out as adherents to Islam. As you can see from this map, there are not many Muslims anywhere in all of the United States of America, although there are quite a few um, uh, concentrated in Southern California. That is one of the pictures that, um, the, that was used in order to sort of signify Muslim presence now, I am not a Muslim, but there's something wrong to me with this picture. <laughs> and what would that be? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So this picture circulated. Whoa. Yes, there are. And this picture of people praying is supposed to be, you know, the proof of it, but they're not praying, they're being tortured. So this picture of people being tortured circulated as a picture depicting the threat of those being tortured. And this is sort of bringing me to, you know, one of the points that I, I wish to make about the, you know, complete uh, uh, saturation of violence in the ideology and system and outcome, which is how um, Guerin described fascism, the ideology, system, and outcome of the carceral state. And that is to say that the explanations for why this punitive excess Professor Owens was talking about this punishment, punitive excess, exists, is allegedly to present, prevent something happening in the future, which is actually happening in the present, right? So these people are being tortured before our eyes, before our eyes, allegedly to keep violence, which is what this is, from happening. And then further, further, what happens is that these modestly educated women and men in the prime of their life, again, who's in prison, right, become not only the bodies that can be tortured, right, the bodies that can be killed, right, this is the practice of racism that produces race, right, this is the practice of racism that produces race rather than race that culminates, unfortunately, in racism, but these bodies then are the skin that holds them together which is the marker of difference, becomes incapable of containing rights within, right? They are dis, rights are disembodied, and what fills that void is potential violence ready to pounce, right? So that is what these people are. 
They, are, they have no rights in their person, which makes torture possible. Because you know, under international covenant, the only thing we all have a right against is being tortured. We don't have a right not to be killed because war is legal, right? The only thing, the only universal right that everybody's like signed on to, except for probably the United States, is torture, right? <laughs> so these bodies, if they were being tortured, means they have been completely eviscerated of rights, right? And so this is the alienated labor that I'm trying to profile for you. The modestly educated women and men in the prime of their life who is in the free world in an economy that was working, would be making their livelihood, making, moving, growing, and caring for things, right? This is what we do just to be alive. It's not about capitalism, it's about just economic activity for life. Instead, are enduring over and over forms of torture. So let me zoom forward. So these are pictures from Adam Gray. These are pictures. This is a picture of an ordinary, what they call social prisoner, in the security housing unit in uh, Pelican Bay State Prison in California. He's been in the hall since 1979. He's been in Pelican Bay since it opened in December of 1989, and he will die in the hall. There's no way this man will ever not be in solitary confinement. And he told, sent this, smuggled this picture out because the uh, guard had tossed his cell looking for contraband. And I, I encourage all of you to go visit these prisons. So you can try to imagine how anyone can sneak anything in, right? Anything in. If you're not a guard, you can't sneak. Um, so they are talking to this prison and they said, this is the picture the department advertised to show 